I'm going to get a new sermon series today about money. And the title of the sermon series is called Uncommon Sense. Because the biblical perspective about money and possessions is counterintuitive to that of the culture in which we live in today. I mean, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And our world says... Earn all you can, spin all you can, and then sit on your can. <laughs> but there are multiple reasons that I want to preach this series about money. One is because we are living in, in tough economic times. I mean, times are tough and money is tight. You look at the world news and you see around the globe, there are entire countries that are on the verge of economic collapse. You look at our own country, there are people marching on... Wall Street and across uh, our cities, across the nation, and they have as one of their stated goals the economic collapse of our country as we know it in a sense. But unemployment is up, income is down, bankruptcy and foreclosures is at an all-time high, the stock market is unstable, and nobody knows how prolonged this is going to last. And I tell you, for some of us, it's probably going to require in the future, if not already, that we're going to have to make some dire uh, financial adjustments in our life. And everybody's talking about money these days. You look at local and, and national newspapers, local and national radio and television spots. I mean, they, they devote entire programming to money matters. The presidential candidates are constantly inundated with questions about how are you going to heal our country's economic woes. One magazine said this, for most of us, money and our feelings toward it are dynamic and intense. We love money or we hate it, we fear it or we worship it, but we certainly never ignore it. Another reason for this series is because of out-of-control spending. You know, the most secretive and sensitive subject in marriage in marriages is not sexuality, but it's spending. It's money matters. Somebody said, you know what? Your wedding vows stated till death do us part, not till debt do us part. But debt spending's ripping apart our marriages. And statistics tell us that the ability of Christians, their ability to give to the church is hindered because of outstanding debt. Larry Burkett wrote, Christians are paying nearly 10% of their income every year in interest alone. And sadly, we give only 2% back to God. Another reason for this series is because our church is dreaming for the future. I think we got something snagged up here on the screen. But we are dreaming for the future. We have 10 dream teams. And we are talking about how we can make this church a bigger impact on our community, a more effective church for the future. And there are 10 different teams organized in order to do that. And a lot of those dreams include allocated funds. And if we need to plan for the future, we need to talk about money matters. Now, I heard about one preacher down in the Deep South that had this talk back method of preaching. And when he would preach, the congregation would say something back. And he was talking about the future of his church. And he got up and he said, this church is like a cripple man that needs to get up and walk. And the congregation said, let it walk, preacher, let it walk. He said, this church is like Elijah on Mount Carmel. He's got to run. He said, let it run, preacher, let it run. He said, this church is like going to have to mount up on the eagle's wings. And we're going to have to fly. He said, let it fly, preacher, let it fly. He said, this church is going to fly. We gotta talk about money. And they mumbled, let it walk, preacher. <laughs> Just let it walk. <laughs> How is it that that one word, money, can dampen the spirit and the mood of even church? And if we're gonna talk about the future, we've got to talk about money. Even in times like these, God wants his church to soar currently and to the future. And that's only going to happen when His people maintain a biblical perspective with their attitude toward money and possession. So we're going to look at several aspects about money in this series, Uncommon Sense. And today, the title of the message is Uncommon Perspective. And please do not tune me out because I'm talking about money today. 
Because your perspective about money and possessions will undoubtedly affect your eternal destiny and not only your own, but your families and even our community in which this church exists. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So I want to look at some uncommon perspectives today. And the first is, I want to look at myths that sound like truths. Myths that sound like truths. Romans 1 says they exchange the truth of God for a lie. So myth number one is all the church cares about is my money. That's a myth. All the church cares about is my money. I preached a series of several sermons back in my first ministry, I mean over 15 years ago, and I was about halfway through the sermon series, and I was walking among the people before worship began, and I was greeting people, and there was this saint, this elderly saint sitting there, and she, I shook her hand and she pulled me down and she said, are you going to be talking about money again today? She'd already seen the back of the bulletin, the outline there. And I said, yeah, I'm going to talk about money today. She said, you better not talk anymore about money because it offends people when you talk about money. I said, well, you know, she's pretty serious about that. And uh, she was the same individual that was very vocal in the church about the church not preaching enough on hell. So I thought, hey, I'll just use the logic with her. And I said, well, did you know that Jesus preached more about money than he did heaven and hell combined? And she looked at me and she said, I don't care what Jesus preached. You better stop preaching about money. And man, I got away from her. I, you know, you never know what's going to happen. But why do people get so uptight? When you talk about money in church, I think one reason has to do with spiritual immaturity. Jesus had a conversation in the Bible with a guy called the rich young ruler, and he bought, brought up this topic about money, and that rich young ruler got up tight, and he turned, and he walked away from Jesus. And you know what? We can get up tight, too, when money's brought up, or like that rich young ruler, and we kind of want to walk away, but our, that, that, our, our views about money and finances and possessions are a foundational principle that will affect our eternal destiny because it gives us a thoughts and a basis of whether we're going to reject or accept the entire gospel message. I think another reason people get uptight when money's mentioned in the church is because we're already financially strained. And if you're having difficulty meeting your bills every month, and it's a strain just to do that, and you hear the church talking about money, well, you get a little uptight about that. Maybe, maybe a little uneasy or embarrassed because you start looking at giving to God just like another bill at the end of the month that you know you just cannot pay. Rick Warren says there are two top complaints in the church. By non-regular church goers. And number one, is church is boring and it doesn't really relate to my life. And number two, the church is more interested in my money than me. But it's a myth that the church is more interested in your money. To the contrary, the church is the one place you're going to hear the message that's different than the philosophy of the world that can affect your eternal destiny. And it's kind of an uncommon sense thing. Our text today comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, if you want to open your Bibles and follow along. The verse is going to be up on the screen, but you can read through that if, if you don't want to listen while I'm, I'm preaching or something. But verse 9 of 1 Timothy chapter 6 reads this. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So why shouldn't the church talk about money. Jesus talked about money five times more than he talked about prayer. Sixteen of his 38 parables, he talked about money and possessions. Listen, the word believe in the Bible is used 272 times. Pray, 371 times. Love is used 714 times. The word give is used 2,162 times. 
In fact, 2,350 verses in the Bible, Jesus talks about money-related matters. There's a direct correlation between our hearts and our wallets that Jesus wanted to make clear to us. And if I want to be faithful in preaching the entire gospel, it's imperative that I talk about money matters. Throughout the year, I try to plan sermon series where I cover a wide variety of topics. And I've got to be faithful in that. The Christian Lookout has it, had as its theme money. And it said this, that it's all a matter of perspective. And it gave this illustration. It says, why does a $20 bill look so small in the grocery store, but when you walk into the church, it looks so large? It's all a matter of perspective. <clears throat> Myth number two, enough money and possessions can satisfy me. I read a plaque that said, money may not buy you happiness, but it buys you the kind of misery you enjoy. One comedian said, people say money is not the key to happiness, but I've always figured if you have enough money, you can have a key made. And we laugh at that, but you know what? That's the philosophy of the world in which we live. And many of you probably grew up with parents who were concerned about teaching you the value of the dollar. And maybe inadvertently as you grew up, you learned that your security, your self-worth, your value as a person was in direct correlation to how much you had in assets. And maybe your parents didn't really mean to communicate or over-communicate that to you. But you know, they kind of taught that. And they said things like, you, know, you really don't want to go into the teaching profession because teachers just don't make a lot of money. Or they said, you know, your older sister, she and her husband, they, they have a vacation home and they're putting in that pool right now. And they overemphasize that importance to you. But it spoke value, volumes to you about values. And it may have been subtle, but you began to develop this mindset that you are what you own. And you need to protect what you have. And now we're all grown up and we live in this culture that is so materialistic. And it reinforces that same value system. And entrepreneurs, uh, wealthy entrepreneurs and wealthy athletes are praised and to be respected. And they're lifted up high as role models. And anybody that has a lot of money, they're, they're talked to as, as though they hope have more respect than other people. And, and advertising and the media all communicate that there's something synonymous with being wealthy and happiness. Psychology Today did a study and they, they polled 20,000 people. 74% said the way that we keep score of a person's worth is by money. But our Christian perspective about mere material possessions and money should be radically different than our worldly counterparts. The Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. And Jesus taught us to think and feel and behave differently when we're viewing our money. What did he say? Don't lay up treasures in, on earth, but store up treasures in heaven. Beware of greed. A man's life doesn't consist in the abundance of what he possesses. It's more blessed to give than to receive. He taught that a person's value is not measured by our assets, but by our relationship to him and our relationship to other people. And if we really want to follow Jesus, it might be that we need to dramatically shift our mindset about money and possessions. The Bible says whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. And deep down, I think we know that's true. And we might say, you know, there are more important things than money. But we work tirelessly. And we spend and we make more because we think if we make a little bit more, we're going to feel a little bit better. So instead of trusting God, we, we trust in things. And we trust in our savings account. We trust in our stocks and bonds, the stock market. We, we trust in our, our, our insurance policies. And if we trust money in our things and our efforts more than we trust God, our world's going to turn upside down. Our text says today in verse 10, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. 
Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And let me just say this about money. Money's neutral. It's not evil. It's not righteous. It's kind of like rain. Rain waters the crops and they grow. But when rain can also wash away and flood our crops. So money can be a curse or it can be a benefit. It depends on what we think of it and how we use it. It's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. And some of you here today are associated with people every day that they emphasize who you are, it's about what you got. And they talk about their possessions daily and that attitude and mindset can rub off on you if you're not careful. That's why Jesus said this, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of his possessions. There's an old hymn that says this, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Is that true with you? And you know, that's some uncommon sense, some uncommon perspective. Now I want us to see some truths that sound sometimes like myth. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. So let's look at some of these truths. Truth number one is everything I own belongs to God. I'm a temporary steward. Our text today says in verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. One of the basic principles throughout the entirety of Scripture is that God owns everything and He provides us with stuff for our enjoyment. Psalm 24, it says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. I speak sometimes of my house, my car, my family, my ministry, my church. But you know what? I don't own any of those things. They are on temporary loan for my use by God. I mean, seriously. Think about it a hundred years from now. Where's all that stuff going to be? I mean, probably 15 years from now, my car is going to be going down a conveyor belt in a junkyard that's going to be pressed into a queue to be recycled and made into somebody else's car. My body, I hope it's a long time from now, it's going to get recycled and get, I'm made out of dust. I'm going to turn back into dust. Steve Jobs of Apple died last week, age 56. A wealthy man. And uh, his commencement speech to Stanford back in 2005 has been played a lot since his death because it seems so profound. And I'm going to read a portion of that and we're going to have a few of those lines up on the screen that I think are very poignant to get this message of what what's going on. We're just living on borrowed time. But listen to his speech. Listen to how profound it is. When I was 17, he said, I read a quote that went something like this. If you live each day as if it were your last, someday you're probably going to be right. It made an impression on me. He said, and since then, for the past 33 years, I've looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to be doing what I'm about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days, I know I need to change something. And he said this, this is the next line. Remember that you are going to die. Remembering that you're going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking that you've got something to lose. No one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. And yet death is the destination we all share. No one's ever escaped it. And it's as it should be because here's the next one. Death is very likely the single best invention of life, he said. It's life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. Right now, the new is you, but someday, not long from now, you're going to gradually become old and be cleared out of the way. Sorry to be so dramatic, but that's true. Because 100 years from now, it's not going to matter what you own, and you're even going to be gone. 
we're living this life on a temporary basis. And God has loaned us some stuff temporarily. Verse 7 of our text says, We brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. And that fact should humble us that everything belongs to God. Jesus told a parable about a guy whose harvest was much more large than he expected it to be. And it's kind of an illustration of how temporary things are in this lifetime. And when I read through this portion of Scripture, just listen or follow along on the screen. Listen to how many times he says, I and my, as though he's got an eternity to spend those. In Luke chapter 12, verse 17, it says that this guy, he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store all my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you've got plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Earn all you can, spend all you can, and sit on your can. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. And you will get what you have prepared for yourself. Now, it's not wrong to store up and to have things. That's not the point of the thing. God has provided us everything for our enjoyment. We need to be ambitious. But listen to how Jesus concluded this parable. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but who is not rich toward God. You know what? Judgment Day is going to come along. And that's just not... God's not just going to evaluate how often we went to church, how often we read the Bible, how often we prayed. But there's a direct correlation to how we use all of the stuff that God's entrusted to us. And it's an important fact. This isn't just preacher speak. That God's on everything. I tell you what, even our lives, guys, are on temporary loan from God. Truth number two is this. Giving to God is my first step toward financial peace. Sounds like a myth, but it's truth. And the Bible teaches about self-sacrifice. What's the world teach about? Self-indulgence. Get it all for the taking. It's mine. And the idea that we are to give a portion of what we have back to God just doesn't, it just is, that's an uncommonsensical type thing. I'm using a book by Barry Cameron called The ABCs of Financial Success. And he says in it, you're not going to spend your way to financial peace. He said there are people that go out and take loans, to go on vacation. They consolidate loans. They try to, to spend their way to be happy. And he said they come back home and they look at their bills and are they happy? No, they're depressed. You can't spend your way to financial peace. He said you can't cheat your way to financial peace. You can't cheat on your taxes. You're not going to steal your way to financial peace. You're not going to beg your way to financial peace. You're not going to gamble your way to financial peace. But the sure way to experience financial peace is to start giving a portion of what God's entrusted to us back to Him. That doesn't sound commonsensical. Don't tune me out. It's not a preacher ploy. The Bible says, honor the Lord with your wealth. Honor the Lord with your wealth. I know a family who did that. They agreed as a family. We are going to start honoring the Lord. And they were in debt, not giving to God at that time. They were still in debt, but they looked at their spending and they decided we've got to budget to get out of this predicament. And they said, even though while we're in debt, we're going to start giving just a little bit back to God. And they felt better by that. They eventually got out of debt. They eventually worked their way up to 10% of giving back to God. They did so well in that. They started having a savings account. They did so well in that. They started having discretionary spending every month. And now when the kids have birthdays and Christmas and they get money, you know what their kids want to do with their money? They want to honor God with their wealth. And they want to tie that back because they know how faithful God has been to them. And when you honor the Lord with your wealth and you gain mastery over your money instead of your money gaining mastery over you, you're going to be blessed by that. Your family is going to be blessed by that. And you know what? When the church has His people in it, and they honor Him with their wealth, 
the church will be dramatically different because we have honored the Lord with our wealth. In the book, Neither Poverty Nor Riches, it said they, that Americans spend 26 more times on soft drinks than they do missions and outreach yearly than the church. One article that I read, Stephen Clark writes, we were in the process of preparing our annual church budget when a certified public accountant made this observation. If every church member in America were placed on welfare and began to tithe 10% based on that income of welfare, contributions to the church would triple and perhaps quadruple. The church could do so much more if we honored God with our wealth. Proverbs 14 reads, The simple believe anything, but the prudent give thought to their steps. And I think most of us understand that we need to plan well, but few of us are about giving thought to ourselves, or giving thought to our steps and budgeting. Before I marry couples, I talk to them about their goals that they have in life, and then I have them blend those together to set shared common goals. And I had one couple that the top on their shared goal list was when they got married, they were going to start attending church regularly. They got married and they failed at that goal. And I think too many of us put too much stock in the future. We put too much value in the future. When we get married, we're going to start going to church. When we have kids, we're then we're going to start going to church. We'll, we'll start saving when, when my wife graduates. When, when my husband gets a better job, we're going to start saving. We're going to start giving when we get more financially stable. But unless you deliberately set goals and you take note of your next steps, you're never going to achieve your goals. It's like going on a diet or cleaning out the garage. If you don't do that today, you're never going to do it. And just as we have retirement goals, we need to have giving goals. And you make it a goal. You know what? I want to give a little bit to God. Or I, I want to start giving 3% to God. Or by the end of the year, I want to start giving 10% to God. And you start watching your steps. You know, there was one Christian counselor I read. He said that, Nobody has ever come to him for financial counseling who were tithing that was in debt. 2 Corinthians 9 reads, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. Truth number three. Truth number three. I can send my treasures on ahead. Now, the philosophy of this world is he who dies with the most toys wins. But he who dies with the most top toys still dies. And you know what? I've done a lot of funerals. And I like how this one funeral home does it back in Kentucky. And uh, before they close the casket, they don't usher people out. They don't close the drapes. They don't shut a door. But in full view of everybody, they crank down the pillow in that casket. And you know what they do next? They reach in and they take off the ring. They take out the earrings. Anything of value, they, they take that out of the casket and they put it in a case and they give that to the family. What an image, an object lesson for this verse. We brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. Listen to Ecclesiastes. Naked a man comes from his mother's womb. And as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. People try to do that. I know one funeral director said that at one funeral, his, the guys put in a bottle of whiskey and, and cards, a deck of cards, because they wanted their buddy to party in the afterlife. But you can't take it with you. If you could, you wouldn't need it, or it would melt. Either way. But you can't take it with you. But here's the truth. You can send your treasures on ahead. Jesus said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. 
or moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You can send it on ahead. I mean, imagine for work, you go to Europe for three months on a business trip and you got to stay in a hotel room. And they say, when you fly back, you can't bring anything back with you. Now, would you spend those three months furnishing that hotel room with appliances and furniture and beautiful things that you could never bring back home? No. You would wire your money, your treasure, back to America, back to Pueblo West, to your bank account, because you knew, you know, when you get back, you're going to use that someday. You can send your treasure on ahead. And that's the point, the imagery here. This world, it's not our own. Heaven is our own. And we can send that treasure ahead. God wants us to get this point that our treasure doesn't amount in the things that we possess. Our treasure is waiting on us in heaven. And we can push it on ahead. This is just a proving ground. And Christ is looking for faithful people to share his gospel message. Max Jarman. Back in the 60s, had the world's largest apparel company. He took a company from 75 people to 75,000 people. He was known as a Christian business person. And he helped build churches all over the world. He gave millions to Christian endeavors. Well, bad times, said Max Jarman. And he almost, almost lost everything that he had. And one of his friends came to him and said, Max, do you ever think about the millions that you gave away? And he says, you bet. But you know what? I didn't lose a penny of that that I gave away. I only lost what I tried to keep. Our text says this about the rich. To tell them to be generous and willing to share. In this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that's truly life. And you know what? That's an uncommon perspective and we fight a battle being in America today, I tell you that. You think about Jesus and what did he do? It says that he went to the cross and died for us. So we could have the hope of living that treasured eternal life. And it says this about that. It says that he endured the cross for the joy set before him. That's an uncommon perspective, isn't it? But he gave up his earthly possessions. He gave up earthly things. And he sent them on ahead to this point in time to offer that to you. And he tells us over and over and over again. You know what? Our attitude toward money and possessions is very important in the scheme about how we have faith in our Father in Heaven. The stuff that we have is just temporary. And I pray that we can understand the sacrifice in our life that we can give and share with others as we look to our heavenly treasure dwelling.